next speaker is Felicity Muth. She's originally from the United Kingdom. She did her undergrad studies at the University of Edinburgh, which next to Israel we now know is where a certain Charles Darwin also went to school. She spent a lot of her undergrad time in the Darwin Library. Currently, she is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Biology at the University of Nevada, Reno, and she's going to talk to us about some really cool things with bees and their reward strategies in regards to pollen and nectar. So, Felicity. Cool, thank you. So yeah, I'm Felicity Muth, I'm a biologist here at the University of Nevada, um, and I work in Annie Lennon's lab, which is actually the only lab in Nevada that works on bees. Um, and when uh, Bernard first asked me to do a talk today, I wasn't really sure what I was going to talk about, which is why the title is kind of vague on, on the program. Um, but I was actually really glad once I started doing a bit of reading because it turns out that Darwin did a ton of work on bees which embarrassingly I didn't actually know about despite working mostly with bees. So um, I'm really happy to be able to talk about some of that today. So going from the work that Darwin did back over a hundred years ago um, through to the work that we're actually doing today here at the university with bees. So. Darwin and his contemporaries at the time referred to bumblebees as bumblebees. Um, and they were also known as Dumbledore at the time as well. And uh, that's not anything to do with them being humble in any way. It was to do with the sound that they make, the humming sound. And uh, one of the anecdotes that I kind of liked was that uh, Darwin got all his kids collecting data for him. Um, something that I think I might try and do if I ever had kids. So he sent his five or six children out, this was a diagram taken from his field notes, following the bees around his garden, plotting the flight paths, seeing where the bees were going, <clears throat> what flowers they were visiting. And uh, um, from his observations of bumblebees, he noticed this really close relationship that um, one particular species of bumblebee had with the red clover. And so different bees um, have different length tongues, and even different species of bumblebee have different length tongues. <coughs> and what that means is, is for flowers that have nectar um, inside uh, something where they have to stick their tongue in, um, some bees can't actually reach the nectar. So in this case, this one particular species seemed to be able to reach the nectar in this red clover, um, and therefore pollinated the red clover when it visited it, and what Darwin said was, because of this close relationship, if this bee ever goes extinct, then surely this plant will also go extinct. And he then um, elaborated on that relationship, saying, well, I noticed that a lot of field mice destroy the burrows um, of, destroy the nests of bees. So if we ever get too many field mice destroying bees, then therefore the plant, the red clover, will go extinct. But of course, there's also a bigger picture, there's cats that eat the mice. Um, so maybe actually the future of this red clover is being detected by cats. So then T.H. Huxley, who was already mentioned earlier today uh, by Israel, um, who was another biologist at the time, and incidentally the grandfather of uh, Julian Huxley and Aldous Huxley, um, who you might know as the author of Brave New World, um, he came along and kind of in jest said, well, um, it's all the old maids that are keeping the cats. <laughs> and red clover is what we feed to the cows, and roast beef is what we feed to our military. So therefore, we should actually be thanking the old maids for the future of the British Empire. <laughs> Um, I don't know whether Darwin is amused by this or not, um, but, and now we know that the relationship here is actually much more complicated than this, there are actually more than one species of bee that pollinate red clover, but these kind of relationships, uh, kind of food webs, are something that ecologists use to this day, and often they are much more complicated than this, but one part of this kind of stood out to me, which was when Darwin said, okay, if, if bees ever go extinct, then surely the red clover will die. Actually, what's happened in the UK 
is we've destroyed a lot of the clover. So in turning land into agricultural land, you can see this is kind of very barren. So apart from these kind of corridors between these fields, there's no clover at all for the bees. And indeed, lots of the mongol bees have gone extinct or extremely rare now because of this um, intense agriculture. So something else that Darwin worked on a lot um, was orchids and uh, the relationship between orchids and the insects that pollinate them, um, in many cases bees. And uh, so orchids, um, thousands of species of orchids, you probably know some people keep orchids in their houses, and orchids are kind of fantastic because they have all these totally crazy strategies um, to get insects to pollinate them. And one of the orchids that uh, Darwin did a lot of work on was this bucket orchid that is pollinated by eudocene bees. So this orchid produces a scent that the male eudocene bees are totally crazy about. So unfortunately the video is kind of jumping around here a bit, but um, these bees are really attracted to this smell. And Darwin thought it was the female bees, but actually now we know it's the male bees um, who are, that are attracted to the smell because they get covered in the scent from the flower, and then they actually use the scent to attract female bees. So uh, this plant has this, has this bucket in it that fills up with this strong, strong scent, and a bee goes towards it and then falls in. And then the bee has to get out if it wants to survive, and the orchid only provides one escape route, and that's this tiny little hole here. So the male will find the hole to get out, he'll climb up and squeeze out through this little hole. Poor guy. <laughs> um, so, the orchid has pollen that it keeps inside these two sacs that are called pollinia. And what it does is, as the bee is crawling out, it sticks the two pollen sacs onto the back of the bee. But it only produces these two pollen sacs, so it's really important from the plant's point of view that it gets it stuck to this bee. So I'm not going to show you this for an hour, but it actually takes an hour for the plant to stick the pollen onto the back of the bee. And that's because it puts a bit of glue onto the bee first to make sure, here are the pollen sacs, to make sure that they are properly stuck on. And then when the bee finally gets out, um, he'll fly away, he'll visit another uh, bucket orchid, and then make exactly the same kind of mistake all over again, be attracted to the sand, fall into the bucket, uh, squeeze out through the hole, but this time the, the pollen will be transferred uh, to the next orchid. So I'm going to kind of change tack now a bit. Um, that was some of the work that Darwin did that involved bees. Now I'm going to talk about some of the work that we do with bees today. Um, this is the bumblebee, uh, Bombus and Patients. Um, and we often think about honeybees doing a lot of the pollination of the food that we eat. But actually bumblebees are also an animal um, or you know, a group of species that um, are also really important for pollinating the food we eat. So here are some of the foods that uh, we use bumblebees to, to pollinate. Um, in particular, tomato is a really important one. Um, so bumblebees and honeybees, they're what we call generalists. So they don't just visit one particular flower or plant, they visit a whole range. Um, so in a meadow like this, um, a bee might be visiting all these different types of plants. And what the flowers give to the bee is different in every case. So some uh, bees will collect uh, nectar um, from some plants, or they collect pollen from other plants, or maybe they even get something like a, a scent, like we saw just a minute ago. And because plants vary in what they, what they give to bees, so say maybe this blue uh, plant here has really good nectar, whereas this one here doesn't have good nectar, the bee can really quickly learn which flowers have got good, good rewards and which ones don't. And that's so that the bee uh, doesn't make a mistake. When she's visiting all these flowers throughout the day, she doesn't want to waste her time visiting bad flowers. So she uses her, her memory from the past about which ones were the good ones to visit. So this bumblebee is visiting this flower, and as she collects nectar and pollen from the flower, 
she's learning, um, okay, so she's learning about the, the smell of the flower, the color of the flower, the texture of the flower. She's also learning how to handle the flower. So every flower is a slightly different shape or a you know, different morphology. And you can see in this case, she's got to kind of pry open the petals to get inside. And all of this requires learning. And bees are actually kind of like insect geniuses. They're really, really excellent about learning about the flowers that they visit. And because they're so good at uh, learning, we, we use them in the lab just to study learning. So if I, um, I'm, my background, I actually did a PhD in bird behavior, but then I switched to working with bees because they're so good at learning and I'm interested in learning. Um, so we can use these animals to understand learning and memory, you know, not just about bees, but also about other animals. If you are here for band party, please come back down to the group fire. Again, if you are here for band party, please come down back to the group fire. Um, including humans. So what we do is we bring these animals into the lab and we stick numbers on their backs. Um, I spend an awful lot of time with bumblebees, but not so much time that I can actually tell these guys apart. So I have to stick numbers on them uh, in order to tell them apart. And also as a side note, I say guys, they're actually all ladies. Um, uh, animals like honeybees and bumblebees, all the workers, all the foragers, all the ones that you'll see out in your garden visiting flowers, they're all female. So this is what it looks like in the lab. Um, this is a, a bumblebee that's got a number on its back, and she is drinking from an artificial flower. So to us, this might, might not look much like a flower, but to a bee, it looks enough like a flower for her to visit it. And she's got her tongue sticking out, and she's drinking a, a nectar reward. And in the most, the kind of the biggest component of nectar is sugar. So in the lab, we just make up a kind of surrogate for nectar, which is sugar and water. And we can do experiments with bees um, where we look to see how they learn about the flowers they visit in relation to nectar rewards. So in this case, a bee, she lands in this flower, and in just a single visit, she can learn, okay, I visit these blue flowers and I get a good nectar reward. And so this work has been going on for the past hundred years and we know that bees can learn you know, about the color of the flower, the shape of the flower, the texture of the flower, the smell. Um, and more recently people discovered that they can even learn about the electric field of a flower. So uh, plants have a weak charge and bees can detect this electrostatic charge. And this is a kind of visualization of some electrostatic charges um, that people made in the lab for artificial flowers. And the bee would visit um, a flower, say with this, this charge, and get a reward. And then she could learn to go back to um, a flower with the same charge again. So they detect it and they also learn about it. So they have a whole world you know, beyond what we can see as well. And bees don't just learn these kind of simple associations. They're also able to learn like, much more complex relationships. And I would love to talk about all of that a lot right now, but I'm not going to. But I thought I would just uh, mention that I also write um, articles for Scientific American. I have a blog on Scientific American Online. It's called Not Bad Science. And I've written a lot about bee cognition there. So if anybody wants to know more about bee cognition, you could uh, check, out my, check out my website. Um, but what I'm going to talk about now is uh, what I've been doing in the lab, which is uh, bee foraging on pollen. So all the experiments that I kind of just mentioned briefly um, have all been done in relation to nectar. But bees, like bumblebees, they don't just collect nectar from flowers, they also collect pollen. And pollen is really important for bumblebees because um, the adults, they don't really eat it much themselves, but it's what they feed to their developing offspring. So if they don't get the, the, the pollen, and they pack it onto their legs, they carry it back to the colony, um, if their larvae, their developing offspring, don't get that pollen, then they're not getting the protein they need and they'll die. So it's really important to bees to, to get uh, uh, pollen from flowers. And also kind of as a side note, um, you know, one of the reasons uh, bees have been in decline is because of destruction of uh, flowers, and in particular flowers which have great uh, pollen which bees need. Um, so... This is what it looks like in the wild. This is a bee collecting pollen from a tomato flower. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, bumblebees pollinate tomato flowers. And 
uh, tomato plants don't actually have any nectar, they only have pollen, and honeybees can't pollinate them, they can't get the pollen from the flower. And that's because uh, they don't, what we call buzz, so uh, bumblebees, they vibrate their, their body against the flower, and it causes the pollen to come out, so you can see all this pollen shooting out here. And then once the bee gets covered in the pollen, she then scrapes it into these pollen loads that actually you might be able to see on her back, on her back legs there. So this is what it looks like when a bumblebee collects a pollen in the wild. In the lab, um, we make these fake flowers. Um, again, might not look much like a flower to us, but it looks enough like a flower to a bee that she's willing to, to visit it and collect pollen from it. This is just a pipe cleaner, we buy them from Michaels and Marino, um, cover them in pollen and a bee will come and she'll collect pollen from this flower. And uh, again, you might be able to see her tongue coming out occasionally as her tongue comes out right there. She's regurgitating nectar, she's using that to pack the pollen into these pollen loads that you might be able to see on her back legs right there. Um, and then she'll carry it back to her colony um, and give it to the developing offspring. So using these very simple artificial flowers, um, oh here's another one, so this time a bee's drinking nectar from this flower, so we can put both nectar and pollen on these flowers, she's drinking nectar out of as well, and also that's obviously not how bees normally move, something's gone funny on the video, but um, yeah, so she, we can have, we can design like these experiments where we choose which flowers will have nectar and which ones will have pollen, <clears throat> and then uh, we give bees kind of these arrays. <coughs> So we'll let out an individual bee and uh, we can design experiments where we kind of manipulate what her experience is. So in this case, say, um, these yellow flowers have pollen and the blue flowers have no pollen. And so a, a bee will fly around and she'll um, visit the different flowers but only ever find pollen on the yellow flowers. And I'm going to show a video now of what that looks like and this is slowed down uh, to half speed just so you can really see her behavior. So she comes in, and we know that bees like the color blue, so at first she's checking out all the blue flowers, but there's no pollen here, so she's kind of antenating it, sticking her antennae on it, um, but not finding any pollen there. And then she lands on the yellow flower, and she finds the pollen, and she starts collecting pollen on that yellow flower. And what we do in an experiment like this, a learning experiment, I'll give her a few trials so that she gets to um, visit, say, um, 50 flowers, um, and she only ever finds pollen on these yellow flowers. And she keeps collecting the pollen from the yellow flowers. Every time she visits a blue flower, there's no pollen there. And then eventually, um, I assume uh, that she's maybe learned that the pollen is on um, the yellow flowers, but in order to test that, I give her a, an array of flowers that's exactly the same as this, but this time there's no pollen on any of the flowers. Um, and if she's learnt, okay, I go to yellow flowers to find pollen, then I'd expect that in this test she would only go to the yellow flowers to look for the pollen. And so this is what a test looks like. So she comes in, and like I said, there's no pollen on any of these flowers this time. And I have to say, I do feel slightly mean when I do this, because, <laughs> you know, she's like, I've learned so well that there's pollen on yellow flowers, and now there's none here. Um, so, so that was something that, that I did in the lab since being here in Nevada. And actually, that was the first evidence um, that bees could learn features of the flower associated with, with pollen. And we were really excited about that, because it means that when you see bees, bumblebees, flying around outside visiting flowers, we know now that they're not just uh, remembering about uh, the nectar they've collected from other flowers, but they're also remembering the pollen. And we've kind of done elaborations on this setup now, looking at different colors. They can learn, you know, on that fake flower we had those yellow and blue discs, that was kind of mimicking petals, but they can also learn about the anther color. And we tested them up to seven days later to see if they can remember that association seven days later, which for an animal that only lives a few weeks is a reasonable amount of time and uh, they seem to remember those associations even seven days later. So when bees are out foraging, they're using these kind of long-term memories as well as what they've just learned that day. And so I'd just like to finish um, by saying that 
I talk mostly today about, about bumblebees, because that's the, the species, the animal that I work with. Um, but there are so many other kinds of bees here in Nevada, and actually we're really lucky in this part of the world that we have a, a really great diversity of bees. Um, when you talk to people about bees, normally the first one they go to is the honeybee down here. But honeybees aren't actually native to the States at all. They were brought over by Europeans who wanted honey, wanted their own European pollinator. Um, but actually we have loads of other bees that are as good pollinators as the honeybee. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more about the pollinators that you might have in your backyard, especially if you're growing native plants here, um, these are some really good resources uh, to check out. Um, and if you'd like to know any more about the research that I do, feel free to check out my website um, or my blog at Scientific American. Alright, thanks so much. Any questions for Felicity and get done? Cool, yeah. How many bees use the hives that I see in the alfalfa, especially the alfalfa fields, and those bees right so, one of my uh, lab mates from my lab is here with me today, and she actually knows an awful lot about more about bees than I do, so I might be like deferring some questions to her. Okay. So, everything you see on the Yeah, so we use, we use honeybees as our main kind of pollinator in agriculture. And they're the ones you'll think about when you, you know, see people in the full bee suits taking out the honey. And incidentally, the, the reason we take, all bees make some kind of honey, but we only take the honey from honeybees. And that's because they make, like a lot of bees will kind of hibernate through the winter and their colonies will die out, whereas honeybees will last through the winter. But in order to do that, they have to make these giant food stores, kind of like having a larder or a fridge just full of honey. So they make all this extra food that we then take. Um, you know, bumblebees, our bumblebees make honey too, but they just make such a small amount, it's not really worth us taking it. Um, people also, like I said, use bumblebees in agriculture, but the setup is kind of different to the honeybee setup. And actually, um, I think people are branching out more into thinking about using different types of bees as well, because it's not totally sustainable just using one, one animal for everything. <coughs> yeah. Is there such a thing as racial memory in bees? Because I heard that there are a number of the bees that are remembering, you know, just some kind of memory that bees have now. So it wouldn't, um, I think bees are really good at learning and remembering things. So it wouldn't surprise me if within one bee's lifetime that she could recognize different beekeepers. We know, for example, that wasps can recognize different people. Um, in the lab, we often make jokes about bees liking some of us more than other ones. There's no real evidence for that. Um, but they do learn about predators, for example. Um, if the uh, crab spiders live on flowers and they attack bees, they learn very quickly to avoid places where there are crab spiders. So if there's one you know, person who's disrupting a bee colony, I would not be surprised if they learn very quickly to avoid that person. Um, yeah. Are the offspring born with this knowledge that the parents have learned? No, so that's the thing about learning, is unfortunately it isn't uh, passed on through the generations in that way. Every animal has to learn it new. So what they, what they inherit is the ability to learn, um, but the actual knowledge is, um, is learned every generation. And the reason for that is just because the environment changes so much that what one bee learns in her lifetime might not even be relevant, say, a month later. So that her sisters, who are maybe being born a month later, will learn, will learn new information. Yeah? What's the latest on colony collapse disorder? So, um, basically, yeah, over... There's been a lot of media attention on bee declines, both um, kind of the honeybees that we keep for, for agriculture, but also uh, just native populations of bees. Um, there are so many factors that, that are influencing this, um, and a lot of really good articles online. I think that uh, I read one that, said that had seven different kind of interacting factors, but there are some, there are some main things that, that aren't, um, you know, particularly, I don't know, some things that seem rather obvious. So for example, the massive destruction of bee habitats. 
you know, if you take away all their food, of course they're going to be struggling. So the, the native bees have been struggling a lot. If, you know, I showed you the picture in the UK, when we turn all this land into farmland and we don't provide flowers for them, um, of course, you know, uh, has obvious effects. Um, pesticides, you know, pesticides are used, they're designed to kill insects. So it is, again, not totally surprising when insects, other insects suffer because of use of pesticides. Um, we often worry about honeybees, and if honeybees, um, you know, when, when we're having trouble because a lot of the honeybees are dying, this is, this is kind of bad for us in terms of our food, because, okay, the cost of, uh, you know, berries goes up, but in terms of uh, the planet, especially in America, because like I said, they're not, they're not even native here, um, if honeybees were to disappear from America tomorrow, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, on the other hand, all the native bees that get a lot, a lot less attention, um, if they were to go extinct, then we really would be in trouble because they form such an integral part of all the, the food webs and the ecosystems we have. So actually, uh, the best thing you can do for bees isn't necessarily to go out and buy honeybees, it's to grow more native plants in your garden to provide the food for all your native bees. Um, I don't know if Devon is Good evening, that. Discovery visitors. <clears throat> Please join Holmita um, in the atrium near else? the Rusicolm Pine Tree for an exciting science demonstration. Please join Holmita <coughs> in the atrium for a science demo. So, how does the honey be got to those So, yeah, so the question was, is if a, if a bumblebee has to buzz the tomato plant to get the pollen out, how do honeybees get pollen? And uh, I could again talk about this for an hour, but I won't, I will summarize it in a quick sentence. Bees have very different strategies from getting pollen from different plants. So bumblebees, um, they can buzz, but also on my fake flowers, they're not actually buzzing that, they're using a different strategy where they kind of just scrabble with their legs. Um, and so every bee has a different strategy basically for collecting pollen. So they can get pollen from different types of plants. So yeah, maybe they can't get it from the tomato plant, but they can get it from, from other plants. Okay, if there's no more questions, we'll go on to our next speaker then. Or if we have, okay, we have one more and there's two hands up. Uh, on those big monoculture areas in Europe that you showed us at the beginning, are they asking the farmers to just plant little strips of yeah. red clover? I mean, how, how, that's not hard. No, exactly, and that's that's the, like the sad thing, right? It's often like this, the the solutions to these problems aren't that difficult, you know. But um, there's a, a scientist called Dave Wilson in the UK, and he's done he's started the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, and he's done a lot of really good work. And the government actually now gives subsidies to farms for putting um, plants on their land, just setting aside some land just for plants for bees. And most of the time, farmers are really happy to do this. You know, they don't necessarily know the details, but if somebody comes and tells them, like, hey. You know, you could be doing all this stuff, but bees are totally happy to put in, yeah. And so hopefully those kind of things could be implemented more in the States as well, because there's similar, similar problems here. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Next